Great, good to see you. You're here. Hi, Ralph, how are you? Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, and and can everyone hear me okay online? Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. The, welcome Very to clear. New Directions Spotlight on Taiwan. I'm Ralph. I'm the director of the British Council here in Taiwan. And welcome to everyone that's joining us online. And welcome also to all of our guests that are joining us uh, here in person today at the British office in Taipei. And although we're delivering New Directions online this year, we're able to gather in person like this in Taipei because Taiwan has done such a fantastic job in limiting the spread of COVID-19. In fact, yesterday was the 200th day since the last reported domestic infection of COVID-19 in Taiwan. So I personally feel very fortunate to be here. And we're joined today uh, on my right by Lin Shu Min, uh, a specialist in junior high and elementary education at the K-12 Education Administration at the Ministry of Education in Taiwan. And we're also joined online uh, by Professor Barry O'Sullivan, who's the head of assessment, uh, who's the head of assessment research and development at the British Council and is responsible for the design and the development of the Aptis test service. In this spotlight session, Professor O'Sullivan will be talking about English Impact Taiwan, which is utilizing Aptis to conduct a baseline study into the English language proficiency of grade nine and grade 12 students across the whole of Taiwan. And also the Sprout Consultancy Project which is evaluating the plans of 15 Taiwanese universities to improve English learning outcomes in institutions. Professor O'Sullivan will be talking about some of the theory behind these studies, how results can be used to inform education policy, and also the opportunities that they're going to create for future research collaboration. After Professor O'Sullivan's talk, we will have 10 minutes for questions and answers, both from our online audience and also from our live audience here. Um, but before his talk, I'd like to invite Lin Shu Min to provide a little background about why the Ministry of Education commissioned these studies and how they plan to use the results. So without further ado, let me invite Lin Shu Min to say a few words. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Ralph Rogers, the director of the British Council Office in Taiwan, and ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to attend the conference and discuss with you the issues about English language assessment, learning, and relative policies. In Taiwan, English language education has always been a major concern in our education system. We expect our students to achieve the following five goals through our English language education. First, they are expected to develop English listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills and apply them to their daily life communication. Second, they can learn to acquire a knowledge in different fields by English. Third, they can be equipped with a variety of effective English language learning strategies, which can serve as a stepping stone to their lifelong learning. Fourth, they can develop their global perspectives and broaden their households while showing respect for diverse cultures. Fifth, they can cultivate the ability to think logically, analyze, integrated and innovated in English. In 2018, the government announced a policy titled Blueprint for Developing Taiwan into a Bilingual Nation by 2030. One essential part of building a bilingual nation is, a, is the English education in school. So the Minister of Education and the British Office Taipei 
sign a letter of intent at a ceremony on October 21st. We would work together to further English education through the cooperation with Taiwan and the United Kingdom. We believe that the cooperation would support Taiwan's target of becoming a bilingual nation. To implement the 2030 bilingual nation policy, the Ministry of Education has also worked with British Council to conduct a research project titled English Impact Taiwan since September. The project will accurately and objectively assess, the, and assess and diagnose the English language proficiency of grade nine and grade 12 students across Taiwan. This project also aims to collect the English language proficiency data, providing important baseline data on which future bilingual education policy can be based. I truly believe that the discussions today would serve as important and precious reference for our English language teaching and learning. I would like to wish the conference every success. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Truman. And um, yeah, I was at the uh, signing ceremony on the 21st uh, of October early this month. And as Lin Shumin said, that was attended by the UK's trade policy minister, who said he was a huge fan of both Taiwan and bilingualism, and that he thought that Chinese English bilingualism was one of the most crucial tools uh, for success in the 21st century. So uh, I'm going to hand over now to Barry, who's going to tell, tell us more about the Im English Impact Taiwan study and how that's going to help um, Taiwan realized those ambitions. So over to you, Barry. Okay, well, good morning to everybody in Taiwan. I saw in the news this morning that you had reached the 200 day mark. I was a bit jealous. I'm here in the UK where things are getting progressively worse. Um, but I'm really happy to be here today to talk about this project. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now and as everybody who knows me knows, when I interact with technology, strange things can happen. So we can just wait a moment and see uh, with a little bit of look, if it'll work. That's looking great. Okay, great. Right, what, today I'm really happy to have been asked to talk about this because English Impact is a, an idea that I had, oh, I don't know, five or six years ago. And it, in the, the original conceptualization of it, it looked a lot different to now, but we had some fantastically good people who worked with us at the British Council, and Liz Shepherd being one of them at that time, who helped to form the project into something really solid. We also work very closely with Acer in Australia and Martin Murphy there was our world leading expert on sampling who we leaned on heavily, it has to be said, in thinking about how this whole project might work. So I'm talking about it, but other people have done quite a huge amount of work to make this possible. And of course the country teams Without those, it could not happen. It would be impossible. In the same way that uh, the English Impact Taiwan is reliant almost entirely on the country teams now. So from the British Council perspective then, we take a perspective that a learning system should be comprehensive. And, and we, we, we've come up with this concept of the concept, comprehensive learning system. Uh, we've written a perspective or I've written a perspectives paper on it recently and in this system you can see that the curriculum the delivery and the assessment are all connected together but they're dependent very much on the context of use so one learning system developed for my country for example is not necessarily going to work in yours we have to take into account the context of use if the system is to work fully it must be built on solid theoretical foundations. So for example, 
if you look at the middle box there, the curriculum delivery assessment, on the side you see progression and measurement models. Well, progression is language progression. We need to have a very clear theoretical idea of how people progress in their language development. But we also need to underpin that with a clear measurement approach so that we can actually, at some point in the future, make sensible decisions as to whether somebody has improved or not. The proposed actions need to deliver the intended consequences are clearly described in the theory of action. The theory of action essentially looks at the, 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 the people and takes into consideration what the people who make up that context of use need to know. What are their needs? What are their expectations? Basically, the argument being that if we want all of this to succeed, we have to take the people who make up that context of use with us. They have to support it. We can't leave that to chance. We don't leave that to the end of the process. The idea is that we think about that right at the beginning of the process. And the, the, the more clearly we can think about at the beginning of the process, the more likely it is it's going to actually work for us. That's a very critical part of the whole concept. We also think of a communication plan or a communication model from the beginning. So the idea there is that we're thinking of how to communicate because different people will need different types of communication and we'll need different modes of communication. So we need to consider that from the beginning and we need to think, who is going to create that communication model? Who's going to create the plan? And who's going to deliver it? Because, you know, I might be quite good at writing um, technical documentation for a test, but don't ask me to write a press release because I would be pretty useless. So I have learned over 25 or more years of talking, actually 30 years now that I think of it, 30 years of talking to other test developers and academics, how to talk to them. Whereas we need different skills to talk to other stakeholders. That's the point. Okay, supporting the vision then. And we can see that this is taken from the documentation itself. The English impact study then, the, the idea is we create a baseline study into the English language proficiency and motivations. I think that's really important that we get not just the proficiency, but we also get a, a hold of what motivates people to learn. Because what we want to do over this period is not just improve their language, but motivates their concern with using language in their daily lives as part of their working lives or even their home lives. So without that motivation, language proficiency is, it will always be a secondary thing and it, it won't lead to true bilingualism. In terms of the Higher Education Sprout project, we're looking, as we, we've heard, into the proposed responses of a range of 15, actually, Taiwanese universities. Now, I'm going to focus mostly on the English impact with a, just a few slides at the end on the um, Sprout project. So if we think about the English impact, basically, it's a tried and tested system. We've done it in three countries now. It's ongoing in four others. We're in discussions with a number of other countries to deliver it. It's, it's, a, it's a very major project, which takes in, because it takes in the variables other than language, it, it gives the, the, the ministries involved a huge amount more information than just testing their language. It's based on the international expertise of the British Council, and we, you know, we have various teams within the Council that work on this. The Australian Council for Education Research, ACER, who are our partners for the sampling. And in this type of project, the sampling is critical. And while the questionnaire is designed usually with a combination of the British Council and the local ministry, the motivation part of the questionnaire has been developed by at the University of Bath. So we have, as you can see, a, a, a group of international experts who work together to build the background to the project. The project itself looks at the Aptis test, 
I don't want to say too much about it, but it's a four skills test. It's online. It's quite an accessible test. It takes just over two hours and it gives a comprehensive view and a pretty well up to date view of everyday proficiency in English. It's not meant to represent business English or academic English. It's everyday English. And if you look at the tasks involved in the test, that's exactly what they represent, including, for example, in one of them, it's a, a, a social media type chat, which is, again, part of people's lives these days, though not mine, I have to say. It, there's also this learner questionnaire, and the very important part of that is we collect demographic data, including socioeconomic status, which is very important for ministries. We collect the, learn, the language learning data, and that's formal and informal, in school and out of school. So what opportunities do people have to learn and to use the language? And as I said, we have a language learning motivation questionnaire which in our other projects we've been able to demonstrate is an extremely accurate, if short, measure of the questionnaire. And Janina Ivanovic, in the doctorate, of course, in University of Bath is the person who put that together, a very powerful instrument. So these are the instruments we use in the actual project itself. In terms of the sampling then, it's called a double blind sampling. The idea is that if you are in grade nine or in grade 12, in any school, in any part of the country, you have an equal opportunity of being selected. This means that we are in a position to say that the sample that we create at the end of this is highly representative of the national sample. So instead of having to test everybody across the country, we can test a smaller number of people. The process is we get a list of all eligible schools at both grades. We then create a random sample from that list of schools. And we ask the schools for the list of appropriate students in the selected schools. We then randomly sample from those lists to get the list of participating students. So as you can see, it's a, a double blind random sample, which means that it's a very solid way of doing things. The actual numbers involved at grade nine, the sampling um, analysis has shown that we need a total of 220 schools. And that will give us 3,300 students. And at grade 12, we have 221 schools and 315 3,315 students. So we, we will be testing as part of this project over six and a half thousand students across the country. So you may ask where? Well, essentially we're looking at four regions and we're looking at North, Central, South and East, including the islands. And we're also our second unit of comparison, as we call them, will be top tier cities and non top tier cities. And essentially what that allows us to do then is to make all kinds of comparisons. So if we think of the regions, we, we have within each region, we have top tier and, and non top tier. And then within each region, we have English language proficiency, we have demographic variables, we have language learning and we have English learning motivation. So we have four sets of data for each one. So we, we can make multiple analysis within this. Now, there's enough data generated in this test to keep a ministry busy for a number of years, it has to be said. And when we think about this project, we're doing it twice. So we're generating huge amounts of data that would be of fantastically great value to the ministry. Of course, it would also be of, extremely interest, of extreme interest to academics and researchers who are interested in the state of play across the country in these areas. So, you know, that is something to consider is, is opening the data or parts of the data at some point down the line. The advantage of this is that over the period from 2020 to 2030, we are, we get, I'm assuming we're going to do something similar in 2030, 
it gives us the opportunity to get a real measure of success and progress over time. And that's the critical thing. It may be that the ministry will say, well, we don't want to wait 10 years for this. We'll do it again in a few years time or we'll do something similar in a few years time so that we get an idea of where we're moving along to. But the great advantage of all of this is that it allows the ministry to make decisions based on real live data and not just on a wish or a whim not assuming, not saying that the ministry would ever make that sort of decision, of course. So I think that's about enough for that, for the moment. Let's think about the sprout for higher education. Essentially, we're looking at three phases. We're looking at a, a desk-based research phase where we will review and analyze the university plans. Now, I think those numbers have changed since I made that slide. It's now 15 rather than 12, which is always a positive thing. The next stage is field work, where we actually visit the campuses. We engage in research, in interviews, in focus group. We, we collect data live from the, the, the universities. And we create a baseline study looking at exactly what people have done and how they've done it and how they've come to the, ra the reasoning behind what they've done. We then create a series of reports, both for the universities and for the ministry. The advantage of that, or the idea behind that, is that we give people constructive feedback on their approach, and we try to help them rather than criticize them for what they've done, or praise them, but not only praising them, but it's always possible to improve. So we'll, the idea here is we try to make the university plans and make their, their approaches as up to date and as likely to succeed as possible. So the outcomes then for individual institutions will be to perfect their approach. And that's, we would hope, the aim for everybody within the institutions and within the ministry. For higher education in general, I think it, it helps us and helps the ministry to conceive of a more consistent approach across the country. Hopefully going back to my triangle with the um, comprehensive learning system, understanding that all elements of the, of the system, the curriculum, the delivery and the assessment are all connected and trying to drive that concept through all of the phases. And finally, for the ministry, it will help, we hope, the ministry to develop a national um, comprehensive learning system and develop that consideration, that thinking that drives a learning system that can actually deliver in the real world in 2030. And that's the ultimate goal. It's, everything is aimed at delivering towards Project 2030. And I leave it at that. Thank you very much. unmute myself there we go so thanks very much indeed for that Barry uh, the very uh, useful content there just a few of the key messages that I've picked up from that it's we need to take everyone with us we need to get yes. the buy-in from all stakeholders students teachers parents as well as the policy makers and the yeah. and the institutions themselves it's not just gathering data about language proficiency it's understanding the motivations of learners which can have an even greater impact on learning outcome than cognitive ability. Um, it's a double blind sample. So the results are gonna be very highly representative to, to extremely high levels of precision for the whole of Taiwan and to a level of precision that allows those comparisons across regions and, and tiers of cities that, that Barry mentioned. And it's gonna keep the ministry uh, it's going to keep Lindstrom in busy for many, many years, a uh, huge amount of data to pour over. And hopefully that data will be, will it be able to open up to, to education institutions in Taiwan and education institutions elsewhere so yes. that they can, they can help the Ministry of Education analyze and utilize that data to ultimately 
enable Thailand to language learning and, and language policies to succeed as much as possible um, and, and, and to, to create within Taiwan that comprehensive language learning system. So, so that's what I picked up over the 50 minutes. Thanks very much, Barry. Now I'd like to open it up to, um, to questions from the floor. So um, both, both uh, questions from the participants online, but also uh, questions uh, from the room. If anybody has any questions for Professor O'Sullivan or, or, or even for myself or Lin Shumin, please do ask them now. We've got uh, just under 10 minutes, but we can stretch it to 10, I think. So first, any questions in the room? Hello, good afternoon here in Taiwan and morning in the UK. And I'm Joe. I'm a high school representative. I'm from Taipei Municipal Zhongzhen Senior High School. I do have a question because actually in Taiwan, we have been trying to promote the idea of bilingual education through uh, the use of English as our you know, teaching and also learning language. And I was wondering about the connection between, in, you know, somehow uh, in English impact Taiwan, this kind of assessment, Aptis assessment, and also cultural literacy. Because in Taiwan, in our curriculum guidelines, we've been also trying to broaden our students' horizons. So I was wondering about, you know, the correlation and also the connection, you know, between students' cultural literacy or cultural competence or cultural fluency and also this kind of assessment. So I was wondering whether this can inform our students or enhance their cultural competence at the same time. Thank you so much. Thanks very much indeed for that question. So Barry, would you like to, to have a go at answering that question? What's the correlation between uh, the kind of assessment tools that we're using like Aptis and this baseline study and, and how that can be used to um, increase cultural fluency as well as linguistic fluency? I think the idea of cultural fluency is really important and I, I agree very much with the Ministry that that is a, a policy worth pursuing. Um, this project is aimed primarily at language, but when we think about the questionnaire, we also ask about opportunities to use and learn English outside and motivations. So I think a lot of what we will find, the, the relationships will be found more in the other data, not just in the testing data. The testing data will give us an idea of the language level of the people. But I think it would be very interesting, for example, to, to, to look at some studies in addition to this study, uh, looking at the culture of fluency and the linguistic fluency or proficiency as a separate entity, you know, as a separate project. Because I think any studies that I've seen in the past that indicate that as our language improves, our cultural fluency improves. And it's, it, it's a little bit obvious, I guess, because, you know, we are actually able to, to read more, to understand more and in terms of cognition, as we take away the cognitive barrier of language, we can put our brain to work in thinking about and understanding more about the context and then the, the, the culture. So when we're, when we're at a low level of language, language is a barrier because our, in terms of cognition, there's only so much our brain can cope with. It can only do so much at any one time, whereas as our language gets better, we, we can take that out of the equation. Now we can begin to focus more. But I, I would encourage the ministry or encourage researchers in Taiwan to take this into consideration and to, to look at additional add-on research, if you like, over the next 10 years to, because, because I know that other research is going to be funded by a ministry and by other people in the country. So it may well be that this is something to look at. But I think it's a very good question. It's a very, very good point. Thanks, Barry. Yes, we, uh, and one we could talk about for much longer. And, uh, you know, I would quite like to say a few words about cultural fluency myself. But time is pressing. So I think I'm just going to open it up 
to more questions because I know we have some questions from our, from our online audience. So Rados, would you like to share one of the questions that we've received from our online participate? Participants. Yes, um, sure, Ralph. Thank you. Uh, so the question is for Ms. Vivian Chung and uh, Barry. How does Taiwan intend to monitor progress towards a bilingual nation in 2030? What specific policy or project success measures would Taiwan focus on? What, <laughs> what the last part of that question, Rados? How does what specific policy or project success measures would Taiwan focus on? Okay, well, I mean, if, if, I, if I could respond to that initially, I mean, this whole baseline study is about measuring progress. And, and right now we're conducting this baseline study to understand the current levels of English proficiency, as well as opportunities, as Barry mentioned, to, to study English, but also the motivations behind it. And I know that the Ministry of Education um, are fully intending to repeat this baseline study at various points uh, between now and 2030 so that they can see how their policy interventions are having a positive impact on learning outcomes. But would you like to say more about that, uh, Lin Xu Min? So, woman, woman, uh, in 呃, 不管是跟人沟通的一个语言的能力 那或者是去了解其他国家的文化 那对于2030国双语国家这样的一个政策目标 跟相关的人员做一些沟通 都是希望提升孩子的英语的学习能力。那至于这样子的一个资源的投入或是政策的制定，到底它的效果是如何？一定是要呃有一些评量的一些工具，而且这个评量的工具跟结果是能够互相做比较的。那所以在呃今年我们
And if I could just add, uh, for me, it's not just language proficiency. As you say, it's about their ability to communicate. It's also about their willingness to communicate and their motivation to communicate. So part of this project isn't just helping people with their proficiency, their, their learning. We've got to cre create the situation where their motivation and their interest is, is increasing as well, where people want to use English more. So we've got to bring them along on these different levels. So it's, it's, a, it's like a multi-level uh, project, this, if it is to work. And, and I'm very, very confident that it will work. I'm also very confident that by 2030, the, the nation itself may not be fully bilingual, but I think it will be a long, long way along the road. And I think there is evidence from other countries that have worked on this and have put the right resources into it, that that is possible. Because in education uh, projects like this, 10 years isn't a lot. We have to take a long-term view, but we can achieve a huge amount in 10 years. I'm convinced. Thank you very much indeed, Barry. Uh, there, I'm sure there are lots more questions here in the room. I'm sure there are lots more questions from our participants online. We do have another session starting in six minutes time, affecting change in educational policy, which I think is very uh, relevant to our conversation. So perhaps we can carry on our questions in the next um, uh, panel session starting at 440 when we're talking about affecting change in educational policy. So, but if people do have questions, please feel free to get in touch with myself. If you'd like to know more about English Impact Taiwan, either in the room or online, please do get in touch, ralph.rogers at britishcouncil.org. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions or fill them on to Barry if he, if he can <laughs> answer them. Um, I just think that, you know, Barry's final remarks that, you know, that whatever happens, uh, Taiwan will have made huge progress in terms of cultivating English proficiency between now and 2030. Taiwan might not be completely bilingual by 2030, but it will certainly have made huge progress um, to, that, uh, to that goal. And certainly we are absolutely delighted to be working in partnership with the Ministry of Education to make those first steps that will, as Barry said, give success every day. Every, uh, give every possibility of success, increase the chances of success. So thank you very much, Barry. Thank you very much, Lin Xumin. Thank you very much to all of our participants online and to Rados for, for fielding the, the, the question in the end. And thanks to everyone in the room for joining us today. Thank you, Lin Xumin. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you to everybody else who's here live and online. I hope to. Yes have this chat live at some stage in the not too distant future. Yeah, we look forward to welcoming you to, to, to Taiwan again, Barry, as soon as international travel permits. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much, everyone. Okay, bye-bye, thank you. Bye for now. Bye.